What is up, Player Profiler Faithful? It's Maddie Keywoom. Welcome to episode 26 of The Game Plan. Folks, we are in rookie season, and there's a lot going on in the NFL. We just saw a massive trade involving the 101 and my main man, DJ Moore. Plus, the NFL draft is just a little over a month away. So obviously, I had to put together a spectacular show fitting for this time of the year. Tis the season, right? So gang, get out your pens and your pads and let's start game planning for our Dynasty Leagues. Planners, whew, my guest today for episode 26 is a young legend in the fantasy world. He is the maestro of mocks and the emperor of player evaluations. He is the host of the future cast and undercover ops. He is also my mock draft bestie and the co-host of the show to come out soon, the Players Lounge. I'm talking about the director of football here at Player Profiler, and I'm also talking about Combine Cody himself, Cody Carpentier. What's going on, my brother? My dog, we're here. Let's go. I forgot my mic. It's over here. Here it is. We're here. I mean, I mean, you invited me on just mere hours after Greg Dorch gets that one round, one year tender with the Arizona Cardinals. Like that's the biggest news we've seen all week. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there'll be bigger news to break other than Greg Dorch getting a one year tender. Uh, we're here. Let's game plan for it. Greg Dorch. I mean, how should teams take on such a big part of news? I mean, Dorch the torch is now back. Is he going to take over Ronda Moore? Is it going to be him going pew, 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 shot? See, I can't even go 35 seconds without all that reference in the show. Wait, wasn't that – that's the wrong Moore, right? Wait, uh, Rondell Moore. Moore. Was, there, was there another Moore traded today, yesterday? Oh, maybe? yeah. Uh, maybe my favorite of all of the Moores, Mr. DJ Moore. Okay, so let's talk about it real quick before we dive into the rest of the show because obviously we have a great show planned. But what are, the, what are your thoughts on this massive trade involving the 101, a whole bunch of picks, and DJ Moore? Am I the only one shocked that you're not wearing that DJ Moore jersey right now? Well, now it's like a Savers jersey. It's like a Walmart jersey. It's irrelevant. It's not even real anymore. <laughs> Shout out to the Savers. If anybody ever went to Savers and got them jerseys, man, that was the real plug of all oh, time. Yeah. But to answer your question, my thoughts on this trade in short, uh, I was just talking to Seth, our editor, this morning about this because he's a Bears fan, so he's on the other side. And I said, you know, if I'm the, if I'm sitting there and what am I going to give up if I'm the Panthers, I'll give up pick nine. And I'll give up DJ, but that's it. If I like yeah. I this, what this tells me right now is that literally what we always thought all along was DJ Moore's one of the most underrated wide receivers in football. Dude's 25 years old, thousand, thousand. This year he went down a little bit, but I mean, the model of consistency, in my opinion, at the wide receiver position mm -hmm. with that big upside, like we saw from AJ Brown, right? Thousand, thousand, go straight to an offense with a quarterback. Like, why are we not drawing the same parallels from? Hurts to Fields, AJ Brown to DJ Moore. Mm -hmm. Like, what are we doing here? It's AJ DJ, Hurts to Fields. This is the same thing reincarnated. Get, let's put some respect on DJ Moore's name first off. I know that's uh -huh. this, this show mm -hmm. needs to have that brought up. But number two is that I think this was an overpay. Uh, it was nine. It was like sixty-one. DJ twenty-four first, twenty-five second. Yep. Like I said, how I value DJ Moore. Nine and DJ Moore should have been, you know, I know it's the one on one, so you're going to have to naturally overpay, but nine and DJ Moore to me feels like, you know, I know it's not enough, but it feels like enough. Plus, you're talking about 61, 24 first, 25 second. Like, come on. It's now. crazy. This, this... I mean, the ninth pick, the second, so the 61st pick, 63rd pick, whatever it is, and the 25 second plus DJ Moore. I mean, you would yeah. think that you wouldn't even have to use your 2024 yeah. round one pick in this deal. And let's call it what it is. And maybe this is a bull take, but. You started talking about it, so I'm going to talk about it as well. It's absolutely the same thing as yeah. A.J. Brown going over to the Philadelphia Eagles. D.J. Moore is better than A.J. Brown in almost every metric that we have other than, you know, fantasy points. But maybe that that catches up this year. He's, he's more athletic. He was a more dominant college uh, wide receiver. He broke out earlier. He was drafted higher. He's just 16 pounds lighter. That's the really the only difference I see between the two. And when you look back at two examples, Josh Allen and Jalen Hurts, they were bottom of the barrel in accuracy rating, true QBR, a whole bunch of our efficiency metrics. They get their wide receiver one, and they shoot through the roof. 
Justin Fields is in the exact same situation. We could see a massive spike up. And for everyone saying, well, they don't throw the ball all that much. Do you realize that at the time, the Bills were like the, I think it was off the top of my like 25th in terms of pass plays per game before they got Stephon Diggs? Jalen Hurts was dead last. I think they were 32nd in passing plays per game before they got A.J. Brown. I mean, let's go. This is insanity. The fact that everyone's saying sell on hype for DJ Moore, you are going to be caught with your schmenzer in your hands when you give away a potential top 10 wide receiver in 2023. We talking about heavies, man. You coming with the heavy takes today? <laughs> yo, Let's go, yo, man. That was sometimes you just gotta provide them heavies, Clip baby. That. Clip you that, get baby. Them heavy. All Clip right, that, so baby. We got a great episode twenty six. We're already starting on absolute fuego. We are gonna talk about utilizing the combine performances when we're evaluating these rookies for fantasy, and then we got a quick one round rookie mock. We didn't get the mock this week. You know, the besties didn't get the mock, so we're gonna mock here today. But before we do, I gotta hit you with a couple of surprise questions that I like to hit with my guests. How long have you been playing fantasy football, and how would you describe your fantasy management style? Very good question. Uh, I've been playing since I was nine. Um, back to the ESPN, the Yahoo BS days where you would go in there and draft against a bunch of smucks that you had no idea who they were. Maybe they were computers. You never know. Yeah. You know you're waiting for that, that, that mock draft room or that draft yeah. room to fill on ESPN, and it was called like the Philadelphia 12 team or the – uh, Dallas 12 team or whatever it was on yeah. ESPN back in the day. And you had no idea who the hell you're playing, but you racked up 20 leagues when you were nine, 10 years old and you just set them babies. Like you knew what you was doing. Um, my, my, I guess my tactic behind playing fantasy football is this is very different than a lot of people's thought process is though, is I take everything, whether it's best ball, whether it's dynasty, whether it's redraft, whether it's keeper, I look at all of them the same, which in some context is good and some context is bad. The reason I do that is because I think every year, kind of like in the NFL, every year is a new year. Yeah, mm-hmm. the Vikings went 13-3 last year, but they cut a bunch of dudes. They're not going to have the same roster at all this year. Philadelphia went to the Super Bowl. They're losing a bunch of dudes. You know, all, all these different things happen every single year. My To put it in easy terms and not to have this be a two-hour conversation on this one topic (laughs) is that I look at every single season in in every single format the same. It's all redraft to me. Everything's redraft. I look at every single year as its individual unit. And, no, you know, when you hear people say, you know, oh, I take Travis Etienne over Najee Harris because Travis Etienne is a dynasty long-term play. Yeah, but in some contexts, I need to win now. So I'm going to take Najee Harris now. In some contexts, I understand this team may be a little farther away, so I'm going to take ETN. But you have to be open to those things. You can't just be like automatically, it's ETN. Like Michael Carter. Michael Carter, that was the biggest one. I guess that's probably a better example. It was Michael Carter versus Javante Williams. Mm-hmm. I didn't think Javante had it out the gate, but I knew Michael Carter was going to have the opportunity out the gate. So I was vastly ahead on Michael Carter because I trusted that he was going to have opportunities. Mm-hmm. And I think Michael Carter perfectly – identifies my tactic as far as all fantasy teams go and all fantasy league strategy goes is that I'm playing for now every single year, unless it's an Mm -hmm. apparent rebuild for a dynasty team and uh, it can help you and it can hurt you depending on those builds. But that's my in short answer. That's how my strategy goes. Great. And that's kind of, we're kind of cut from the same cloth in that regard. I like to look at dynasty. I, I think a lot of dynasty gamers love long form algebra. They love to make it more difficult, predicting the future, game planning, doing all of, well, of course we like the game plan here, but you know what I'm saying? They like to make this as long-term algebraic formula. I like to add and subtract because I'm an idiot. So yeah. I, I like to go year by year, snapshot by snapshot. And when you get to the skinny, you're looking for to get into the dance. I'm looking week to week. Sometimes I will make hasty trades that I look back on and go, what a dumb move. But in the moment, I'm trying to get the chips with the dip. Yeah, it happens, man. Every time. I mean, you're you're running pure is impossible. Yeah, impossible. You're you're going to get God. You're going to get God. That's the way it is. Absolutely. You're going to be caught sitting there without anything to show for it. It happens all the time. So it is what it is. But I love that. I think that's why uh, you and I do so well on these old recordings together. So let's dive right into the first segment, utilizing the combined performances to evaluate rookies for fantasy football. You were there, Combine Cody, live in person. How much fun was that? Heard that. I mean, it was uh, it was fun. It will say that. I've talked about this. It, it's fun. However, it's a lot of work. 
A lot yes, of people, yep. I talked about this with Matt the other day on the Mind of Mansion. Go check that show. It also on YouTube, player mm-hmm. profile, same place you found this. And that is that on the surface, it looks like, oh, you're just going to the combine to watch these guys run 40s. You know, growing up, that's all I thought. I was like, oh, they're going to the combine to run 40s. And then you learn that there's medicals. And then you learn, well, and then you learn that there's more uh, workouts and there's mm-hmm. on field stuff and there's height, weight, and all this stuff. And then you learn that there's medicals. And then uh, you learn that it's just like a big uh, barrage of everybody from all organizations coming together. That's where a lot of communication happens, i.e., Panthers, Bears trade. Mm hmm. Then it comes out within the within the next week. A lot of that thing, a lot of stuff like that happens to me too uh, at the combine. Yeah. But when you're not boots on the ground at the combine, you don't know that you know there's interviews running from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m., 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. every single day of the week. And once I went to the combine last year for the first time with Alex Dunlap, it was. I was like, this is some work, and I'm I'm always down for some work. You know that you're down for some work. I mean, if you're real, when you know. And yes, it's fun at night when you're out there talking to these sources and these Mm -hmm. scouts and these executives and things, and you're meeting up with the fantasy relevant, the fantasy uh, people like John Daigle and McDowell, et cetera, et cetera. That's fun. But when you're during the day, man, your boots in the ground, you're stomping around getting 300 interviews in a week. It's, uh, it's fun. In a, in, a, in a different term of fun. It's a lot of work. It is. And, and I think when you watch on TV, it just looks like a bunch of drills. It looks like a bunch of, you know, rookies going together and trying to come by or compete to see who's the most athletic. But then when you're there, you realize that, I mean, it's like, it's like a family reunion for these yeah. team builders. Yeah. They're all in the same city. They're all rubbing elbows. You know, I'm in sales. So when I go to these conferences, it's like, you're working 24 seven, not just when you're at the conference, you're working 24 seven because you never know who you're going to get drinks with. You never know who you're going to take out to dinner. You never know who you're going to bump into. And I imagine being in Indianapolis last weekend was the same thing. You just have to be on 24 seven wearing shirts like you're wearing today. Just absolutely decked out to the nines looking handsome as can be, baby. So my first question at the combine is Alex Dunlap as cool as he seems? Because I I feel like he's he he he'd be my boy if we were if we got to meet. Well, bro, he's an asshole, dude. What are you talking about? <laughs> who is this asshole? I don't know. I don't know who this guy is. This guy is one of a kind. I, I fucking love Alex. I yeah. am. I have an endless appreciation and gratitude for for my boy Alex Dunlap because um, two years ago we went down to the Senior Bowl for the first time. I did. And Alex has been going there for 10 years. He's been going to the combine for 12 years. Mm-hmm. He didn't have to invite the schmuck down to the senior bowl, right? Yeah. It's supposed to be me and Matt last year, like or yeah, last year going down to the senior bowl after Matt went a couple years before that. And Matt couldn't make it, but he reached out to Alex. And Alex was like, Hell yeah, he can come. And I think I'd only done like one show with Alex at that point. Mm-hmm. And he welcomed me in. We went down to the senior bowl, went to the combine, came to the draft this year, senior bowl combine, draft coming up. Going to some pro days next week. He's walked me through this entire process of learning, learning what the do's and don'ts of this whole thing. And and yeah, I mean, yeah, I get to hang out with him for five, six days on end. And we fucking go out and have some drinks, play darts, play bags, mm-hmm. walk around town. It's awesome. It's all it's a great time. But Alex, he's just a great human. And uh, I just I, I can't say enough nice things about him. I appreciate it for him because not everyone's built like that. Not everyone that's been in a profession for a decade and has a lot of great connections isn't going to just naturally welcome in a young buck and be like, Hey man, let's go. Um, right. I see people b- bringing up Matthew Barry down the, in the chat right now. Barry's one of those guys that, you know, Lance Zierlein, like I, I, I could, I couldn't, I couldn't sit here long enough and write the list of guys that I've met because Dunlap has known them for a decade and we just walk up to him and have a conversation with them, shake hands. And then now they know me and I'm just like, we're just chopping it up. Like we we've, we've known each other mm-hmm. and, that's Alex. I mean, he's right. he's awesome. I just uh, long answer. Appreciate him wholeheartedly. Well, it sounds good. I mean, I had to rock the Bass Pro Shop hat today, so that it's almost like a smoke screen. Like, hey, man, maybe we'll be friends. You know, I can be a little country boy too. But no, that's awesome. He definitely seems like the man, and learn from him. Uh, it seems like you couldn't learn from a better guy in the industry. So that's awesome. Shout out to you, Alex. Next question. So, as the emperor of player evaluations. How much does these combine performances weigh into your fantasy evals? If I had to put a percentage on it, it would probably be in that 
25 to 30 percent range and that's a combination of both athleticism and interviewing um i've talked about it before the interviewing stuff goes into the dog grading and then the athleticism thing goes in overall the athleticism thing uh in my process and in my grading i have a 15 point marker so you call it 15 percent out of 100 15 percent marker for on-field athleticism so when you're watching them on tape mm -hmm. your perceived athleticism of them and what they can do their dexterity and things like that and then you have the real athleticism grade which is obviously the combine testing the things like and the pro day and stuff like that so 15 percent comes from that athleticism that you see at the combine and then i would say probably 10 to 15 about 10 percent goes in from the notes and the interviews that goes into the dog grade uh because okay. the dog grading has its own uh, percentage that goes in, which is 30%, but 10, 15% of that. Does that make sense? Yeah, Putting those yeah. two together. It's about 25, 30% of, of what we get at the combine goes into the overall grade. Cause you still have obviously right. the off field, the film, um, other film notes, other yeah. interviews that you've watched through the whole season, the fits, uh, there's like eight different things that go into it. So yeah, it's about, I'd say about 25 to 30%. All right, so just a quick recommendation for people trying to learn, trying to get their own eval status going. You think that's a good, you know, uh, a north star for them to follow? Kind of put the combine performances as a 25, 30 percent in their overall evals, or do you think if you're starting out, you should kind of do a little bit more or a little less? I think that's a fine, a fine area to start. Yeah, because I think it's like you look at it in like thirds, right? Like films going to be like their entire season based off, mm -hmm. and then I have my my mental off field thing as being like a twenty five to thirty percent pull, and then you have the film athleticism, the real athleticism, and then you have a couple of other things that kind of add up that last ten percent. So yeah, I think that the the combine should have a twenty to thirty percent marker. But again, if you're only seeing numbers and you're not listening to interviews or digging into Twitter, following people that are going to interviews, or you're not partaking in the combine at if you're not at that level yet to where you can go to the combine and get credentialed for it to see people in person and and see Zach Evans is a slender body. He is the uh, Bryce Young of the of the running back position where his body does not look like it's a 225 pound frame okay. like those are different things that that you can only see and you can only know by seeing a right. dude in person so it's it's hard to say yeah put 30 percent on your grading if you're not doing that stuff in person if you only have access to the athleticism stuff mm -hmm. and maybe you're only sitting at 15 to 20 percent but yeah that'd be about the range Okay. In this class, I mean, obviously the 2023 class has been hyped for some time. We've been kind of hearing about it now for, you know, quite a while. So as, you know, this team has, or, or this class having the hype that it does have, is it as good as advertised in your opinion? I think it's, it's yes and no. Mm -hmm. Yes and no, because, so we're talking about the wide receivers specifically with Matt the other day. And he was like, this wide receiver class sucks. And I was like, Yes and no, right. right? Because the top end is like pretty clearly not the same as the last few years have right. been. Drake London, right. Garrett Wilson, Olave, Jamison go top 15. The year before that, Jamar Waddle, Devonta all go top 10. The year before that, Henry Ruggs, Jerry Judy top 15. I don't think any of these guys deserve to go top 15. Right. Quentin Johnston, okay. if he runs in, 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 in a week or two and he runs in, you know, sub 4 4, sub 4, like 4 4 2, he will likely get pushed up to that point. I saw in my mock, I think it was 1.0 or 2.0. I think it was 2.0. I put him at number nine overall to the Panthers. Obviously, you can see that's now changed because the Panthers traded that pick. Mm -hmm. But that was more so, and and I will put this just for context because I'm bringing it up. My, my mocks are not always like pick dependent this early on because you're more so looking at that player to get him in that range. And you're trying to find the range and then you're trying to find the team and you're trying to get the player up there. So when I put like a Quentin Johnson, like nine, it's more mm -hmm. so about understanding that if he does run a sub four, four at his frame and the rest of the class, there's nobody else like him in the class. And it's not even close. There's nobody else. Six, three that could run that fast and has his abilities in this class. So that's why he would get pushed up there. So the conversation needs to be had, but with that being said, he's not on the same level as any of these uh, wide receivers of the last few years. So that brings this wide receiver class down. But like I said in the Manda Mansion, it's the middle of this grouping that I think is where you're going to get some pops. Mm -hmm. The Jaden Reeds, the Xavier Hutchinsons, the Cedric Wil Tillmans, the Charlie Joneses, the Michael Wilsons, the Jonathan Mingos, the Trey Tuckers, uh, the Rashi Rices. These guys are that are the middle tier, the, the, the middle of round two to round five where you're going to go bang, 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 bang. And mm -hmm. you can see three of these guys pop off and be pro bowlers. Um, kind of like I think it was a 2020 class if I go back. Um, 
had Chase Claypool in 49th overall. He's still hanging around. Van Jefferson's still hanging around. Gabe Davis was a fourth round pick. Um, Quintez Cephas had a season there. Darna Mooney, fifth round pick. KJ Osborne, fifth round pick. Donovan Peoples Jones, sixth round pick. Isaiah Hodgins, sixth round pick. Freddie Swain, sixth round. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, they're going to get guys that are, you're going to get guys that are still going to be hanging around the league. Whereas you look at the top end, Ruggs, Ragger, Chanel, Hamler, right in round one and two that are lesser. Like, they, they just didn't quite hit the bar. They didn't pop. They didn't pop. And that's, I think, what this class at wide receiver is going to be, is it's going to have a lot of middle tiering and, and later tiering guys that do pop because of their abilities. You're talking about the running back position in short. I think the running back position is as strong as we've had in a while. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I love the running back position. The quarterback position, I mean, you compare it to last year by itself. Child, please. Come on. Tight end. Child, please. Come on. The And I think that's why this class may be getting a little bit of, of, of bad talk is because the top end of wide receiver. It does That's not really ma- it, right? It doesn't match up. It right. doesn't match up with the last few seasons. So everyone's like, oh, this class sucks. What's well, like, no, the receiver class just isn't as hot. But I mean, Zay Flowers is a dude. Yeah. Josh Downs is a dude. Jaden Reed's a dude. Marvin Mims is a dude. But they're just small ass dudes, right? Yeah. You get a whole bunch of Tyler Lockett's and, and, and fucking Jamison Crowders and shit like that. Doesn't mean they can't play football. And especially we're talking about fantasy specifically. Right. PPR Child gods, guys. potentially. Big child, please. Let's yeah. go. And I also kind of think you could see a quick uh, boost of this wide receiver class because the free agent class is so doggy. It's absolute dog water. So could that lend teams to kind of elevate these guys up their draft boards? And let's just say two or three, maybe even as much as five wide receivers shoot up in terms of where we think they are now to where they'll get drafted. Could all of a sudden we be talking, well, this 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 is a rookie class. You'd like, no, no, they're all of a sudden. Because we have the running backs, we have the quarterbacks, and we have the tight ends. I think so. I, I mean, like uh, this last mock, I had two guys specifically that I noticed that are that seem like they're probably going to go higher than the consensus. The consensus right now has Cedric Tillman, 77, Rashi Rice, 69. I think you're looking at both of those guys being potential second-round picks just given what this free agency class looks like. Marvin Mims, another one that's not getting talked about enough, had a great combine. Um, I think Marvin Mims is a guy that can bump up in there. Tyler Scott doesn't get talked about enough. Jaden Reed's pushed way the fuck too low as far as the consensus is concerned. And then another comment in the chat right now, Jalen Hyatt. Jalen Hyatt, from a fantasy perspective, perspective i don't give a shit but from the nfl perspective the nfl loves him and there's a number of people that are noteworthy that have hyatt numero unsk on their fucking oh, rating so uh, number one huh it, it matters right it matters about as no, uh, about as much as uh cory coleman and, and and henry ruggs being number one but oh. Still dude, great. don't you come at my man Corey Coleman. I have so much faith in Corey Coleman. I thought that guy, I thought he was gonna be a dude, but he fizzled out faster than a coke. It is what it is. It happens to a bunch <laughs> of us, but it is what it is. So, next question I have for you is at this combine. So last week when the combine was uh on and popping, who raised their stock the most in fantasy football? Who raised their stock the most in fantasy football? Marvin Mims came up quite a bit. Um, right. He gained about five or six lifetime value points. Um, I look at oh, I got these beautiful goddamn timers, dude. Sorry to interrupt. Got these timers for like the pro day and combine, and they – I don't know what the problem is, but they just keep going off in the middle of the day. It's like an alarm or something. Beep, 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 beep. So because you got to stay on – you got to stay on the prowl. It's letting you know. Stay on your toes, baby. You can't take a minute off. Is nuts, but so back to the thing. Marvin Mims, Zay Flowers comes in 13 pounds heavier. He came in 170. It was like, hey man, what's he gonna weigh? 183, stacked up. Hemothy.com, all the way there. Zay Flowers, uh, I think, took a big, another big jump. Jalen Hyatt, of course, just based on those conversations, gets a big pop up. Trey Palmer, wide receiver. Yep. Numero Unsk on the dog rating, another big pop up. That was your that guy in mock draft 1.0 that we ran. That was your guy. Heard that. And then uh, the tight end position, obviously Zach Kuntz, he takes the biggest jump at the tight end position going from like wide receiver 14 all the way up to number five. Um, hyper athlete, best comparable to Mike Gusecki. Mm-hmm. No, if you don't know yet, best comparables are up on playerprofile.com. Check it so out. go tap in. You can see um, if I bring up Zach Kuntz's page, he's number one all time at tight end. And I think he's top 15 all time overall. 31 all time out of 5,558 players in the player profile database as far as athleticism goes guys like that that you really didn't know existed 
I mean, I knew he existed, but I didn't think he was going to test out like that. Yeah. Uh, he, were the biggest risers. Dude showed up in Indy, bodied up, bodied up, ready to be an athlete. And I mean, Mike Gusecki, we laugh at him now because he's kind of been a little underwhelming given his athleticism. But coming out, I mean, he was every bit the super athlete we wanted to see. And Koontz, I mean, holy shit, six, seven, two fifty five. Is that how you say it? Forty. I don't know. Is that how you say it? That's what that's what Matt said. Maybe, there, maybe there are kids watching. Is that Matt? I said Matt. Is that how you say it? I'm not sure. That's not how they say it in England. I'll tell you, this guy's a goons. This guy's a cunts. <laughs> so we talked about whose stock saw the biggest rise. Obviously, Anthony Richardson, too. I mean, but he's been talked at nauseum. The guy came out looking like Cam Newton 2.0. Josh Allen is a player comparable for a good reason. Uh, so absolutely, he was a, a riser there. We don't, we've, you've heard that talked about uh, at nauseum. But whose stock also took the biggest hit? Who saw themselves shh? Ball right into the old shitter. Zach Evans. Zach Evans uh, came in teensy tiny puny up top. Uh, there was rumored that he had an injury coming in. We'll see what happens. Mm-hmm. Um, he was once thought of, I thought, as the one dude because it's pretty apparent. Obviously, Bijan's him, and it was like who's going who in this class you could look back in five years and say, yeah, he's going to catch up to him, or he's going to overpass him, or he has the upside to match him. It was it was Zach Evans, just based on what we what he saw in spurts and mm-hmm. his Elvin Kamara esque uh, play style. No, like that's not even in the question anymore, in my opinion. For Zach Evans, he's got mm-hmm. the talent, but he's just too slight a frame. I don't see it anymore. He took a massive dip as far as lifetime value points go at expectation from where he was on the edge of being a top five guy in this class to now he's he's on the on the brink of falling outside the top ten. Given uh, you know guys behind him are Eric Gray and Banacanda. Uh, Abana Canada were expected to run hyper fast. He's also 20 and a half years old. Um, we'll see what happens there. Um, but I think Zach, Zach Evans is on the brink of, of exiting the top 10. A lot of people want to point to Kayshawn Booty, but I love some booty. I always have loved booty, and I think you love booty. So we're ah, going to continue on. Captain Booty. Captain Kayshawn Booty stays. And Mr. Cunts. Can get K- fifth graders in trouble all around the country this year if they're talking fantasy. All cunts and all booty. <laughs> Number five, he stays in the top five at the wide receiver position. The reason being is not because of the combine. Everyone's going to say, yeah, but you guys are a measured based site. Yeah, but but Kayshawn, he ran a 4 si- Oh, he ran a 4 5 oh. That's right. He ran a 4 5 oh in that first run. The second run is what everyone remembers. He ran like a 4 6 4, 4 6 7 on the screen mm-hmm. unofficially. He's still 20.8 years old. Yes, we have a little bit of question off the field, but we'll see. The, the NFL is going to clear that one up, the off-field uh, question, if he's a sex addict or whatever the hell the problem is. Mm-hmm. Yes, he jumped 29 inches. Should his agent be fired? Probably. He probably <laughs> shouldn't have jumped. Yeah. He should have known better. Hey, yeah. hey, Kayshawn, how far are you, how high are you going to jump? Hey, buddy, give me a quick oh. jump real quick. Hey, we're not going to do that today. <laughs> yeah, about 29 inches. Hey, Kayshawn, put your shoes back on. Let's get out of here. Yeah. Like that's that's how that should have yeah. went. And if he if he if he's going to tell people he's going to run four three and he's going to run four five, probably don't run that either. Mm-hmm. But this is what this is my point more so with Kayshawn and why he ends up staying higher is because four five zero is not bad. If we're if he's a four four eight guy and he doesn't promise a four three, you're you're you know four four eight's not bad. And and when you watch him on film too, I always thought DJ Moore best comparable to Christian Kirk. Now mm-hmm. I always thought DJ Moore when I watch Kayshawn, that does not. That does not, in my brain, say four three. It never has. It's always been the high four fours, four five. So the 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 speed is at expectation. Now the on field is where he saved his ass. The on field running the gauntlet and running the routes is where he saved his ass. He was number six overall in grading. Um, this is another back to the Alex Dunlap thing. Alex kind of walked me through last year uh, his grading process and what they've done for the last decade mm-hmm. uh, as far as grading. So you're grading the gauntlet, you're, you're grading the slant and go, the seven route, the dig, the banana, the whip, all these different routes that they're running on the field. I'm sitting there and I'm bang, bang, grade, grade, grade. As they go down the field, Charlie Jones, Charlie football comes in at the top. Kayshawn Boutte sitting right there, number six overall in the routes. So, yep. you know, I told Matt the same thing. I said, if you're an NFL team – and you're sitting there with a hand timer, and you go, you know what? I just clocked Kayshawn Booty at 4.46. And he goes into your book at 4.46, which we know they do. Yeah. After talking to a couple of scouts, in the team official books, they don't use official NFL times. The NFL.com uses official NFL times, but teams use scout hand times because yep. they have guys sitting on their line and they time these guys. So if the Cowboys hit a guy at 4.46, he's going to the books at 4.46. So the point is if Butte is 4.46 on somebody's board, 
and they watched the on-field stuff, and he killed it in the on-field stuff. You can't discredit Boudet just because he had a 29-inch vertical. I know it sucked, but it's why you look at multiple things and not just one thing. And he's not a go-up-and-get-it type of receiver. I mean, his best player compared is Christian Kirk. Uh, Christian Kirk has gotten a whole lot of hate even up to this season. Everyone kind of poo-pooed that massive contract, but he's just a baller and he's stuck around. He's rich now, and he's going to be the wide receiver one with one of the best young quarterbacks. Booty is here to stay, so if you like yourself some booty, don't get rid of him because he's definitely uh, someone that, like you said, if he pops in the second round or even the third, we should absolutely be interested in taking him second rounds of our rookie drafts because the 4-5-0 isn't the end all be all. And that's the that's the point is that – we can only grade him to a certain point. The NFL is mm-hmm. going to give us the answer. The NFL is going to give us right. the answer in, in, in six weeks' time because, like I just said, if somebody has him four four six, they watched it on field stuff and they watched him play at LSU. He's going to be an early to mid second round pick. Now, if you if the NFL is heavily uh, taking into account his burst and agility, and they're not watching his on field and they don't care that he ran exactly what he should have ran, then he's going to be a mid to late third. Or if there's off-field stuff, he's going to be a mid to late to early fourth. Like yeah. that's where he's going to end up being. And you'll know if, as soon as you get through day two, or mm-hmm. yeah, as soon as you get through day two, if he's if he's still on the board going into day three, we're probably off on Keishan Booty. But mm-hmm. if he goes on day two in round two or round three, depending on where he's at, I mean, you're gonna. I'm staying, Captain Booty, man. Captain Booty, we're all up on the booty train. So my next question for you is, what player had a good performance in Indy, but he is going to trick fantasy managers come the regular season? That's a good question. Who's going to trick oh, fantasy yes, managers? Is this a good question? Who's going to pull no, the trick you, bitch? Devon A-Chain. Okay. okay. Devon A-Chain. Point blank, period. He's best comparable to Chris Johnson and player profiler right now. Oh, what a lofty comparison. I know, I know, I know, I know. That's lofty. But- Imagine going into your rookie draft being like, I got the next Chris Johnson. No, I don't. Yeah. And why do you think he could trick? Because he is so small, 5'9", 188. He was dominant in college. He's fast. Chris Johnson comparable. But what is it that's going to trick fantasy managers? He's got the speed. That's what everyone wants. Everyone's enamored by speed. He's not that good of a talent. When you, Sorry not to be disrespectful to him, but he's not that good of a running back talent. When you're talking about mm-hmm. overall output and overall upside and abilities, I just I don't even have him near the top. I had him best comparable to Phillip Lindsay. Um, I think he's got elite burst and, and, and great long speed. He's an all-American 100-meter dash runner, but uh, I think he's got tight knees, and that disables his ability to unlock his agility and it really un- it disables his ability to unlock that ceiling of Chris Johnson. Uh, he's a good pass catcher, but I think he's got slow reactions to accelerate after that. It's a slow processing. Uh, my biggest thing, I think he's just really tight in the lower half, which he's a sprinter, and that's what he's worked on being as a sprinter. Mm-hmm. Uh, in college, that's fine. But, I mean, think about the guys that we've seen year after year in college that are hyper fast, don't translate. And I think that's just a chain on a higher level because he was at a and M and because he was better than <coughs> Spiller. Let me ask you a little follow-up, a uh, little cherry on top here. So his best comparable player, Chris Johnson. Does Devon, does Devon, Devon a chain have this in any realm of possibility? Could this possibly be in his uh, reality of outcomes? Cause I personally do not look at Chris Johnson from his rookie season into two, like into those first six seasons, 251, rush attempts 358 316 262 276 279 does devon a chain ever sniff that volume really this guy had 400 and what 16 touches his second year in the league yeah that's i mean that's just obviously i mean yeah that was a 2000 season right cj2k and he's he's a different dude but does devon a chain a chain have that in his, his range of outcomes hell no because right. first off, nobody's going to give him that range. Nobody's going to give him that uh, range of output. You're, he's never going to see 200 touches. He might see 140, 160. If he's lucky, 180. But I mean, any smart, competent coaching staff would never give Devon Ajane over 200 touches because that would zap his efficiency and zap his speed at this current trade. I mean, you're also talking about that was 15 years ago that Chris Johnson did that. It's an entirely different NFL. Right. The entire league is faster now. And Chris Johnson at that point was a 4-2-4. That's also 4-2-4 is a different level of speed. And Chris Johnson also had an 81st percentile burst score. Like, there's different levels to it. Mm-hmm. D- can he reach it? 
I mean, sure. Does I mean, can a bear climb a tree? Can a bear jump? Like, can <laughs> can can a squirrel can a can a squirrel kill a dog? Sure. Like, but is it realistic? No. No. You know, can I can I beat up Mike Tyson? No. But like, but I mean, if he's 107 years one old, I'll probably catch him. Maybe, maybe is he already like almost dead, and I just kind of what and just get get him one quick. I don't know. Maybe if possible, you know, Chris Johnson's player with comparable is C.J. Spiller. I think C.J. Spiller is kind of the the top range of what Devon A. Chain can be. And when you look at his player page, he only had one season when he finished inside the top ten on a points per game basis. So you're drafting Chris Johnson, but you're probably getting C.J. Spiller, and that, my friends, is enough to trick a ton of fantasy managers. So that's a great, great call there, Cody. Who now? Who are you still high on? despite a man or even bad showing in Indy, you already talked about the booty. Let's talk about somebody else who else did not perform well in Indy, but you're still high on. Yeah. Booty would have been the great answer for that one. Um, but quite honestly, I'm probably going to say Josh down. Uh, we did move him down a little bit um, in the, in the, in the rookie rankings on playerprofiler.com. Go over to dynasty deluxe. You can get that all in package. And you can go to use either of our names and you can get a little uh, 10% juice on that. Use Cody. Boy. He's great. He's my guest. Use Cody. And, uh, you can get a little $10 juice on there, but you can get the dynasty rankings with the rookie rankings included. Josh Downs uh, had a 12th percentile speed score because he's 171 pounds and he's 448. Now, early on in the process, I was like, Josh Downs, Zay Flowers climbed together. And then Zay Flowers was like, hey, Josh, why don't you stay over here and you can, uh, you know, so go ahead much. and get bodied up real quick. And I'm going to go down to Miami, and I'm I'm fixing to just you know eat potatoes and steak for the next two weeks. <laughs> I'm just going to beef up real quick. And then Zay shows up 183, and, and Josh shows up 171. And on interview day, it was like, whoa, Josh Downs. Josh Downs is tiny, bro. What mm. what is Josh Downs is tiny, bro? Then he goes on the field, and he's got the quads. He's got the quads, man. The quads are popping. The route running was excellente. I think he was top 10. He was fourth in routes. Top 10. Fuck me. He was fourth in routes. He mm -hmm. he was a half point higher than Zay Flowers and two points higher than Kayshawn Booty uh, as far as the route scoring grading goes. So Josh Downs is a guy where on the surface, it was a bad first day. Mm -hmm. Not the, I mean, not, not he didn't command the biggest big as an audience as Zay Flowers did. He looked puny on the screen, on the stage. He's got short arms, but I'm riding with him. Uh, best comparable to Wanda Robinson, a player profiler right now. I think Downs is a guy that will excel in the NFL. Uh, multiple quarterbacks over the last two years. He had Sam Howell you know, for 1,300, and then this year he had Drake May right. for a rack city, and uh, his catch rate went up 10%. So I think it's a guy that will excel in the NFL. Again, 268 targets in, tw in, in 24 games in college the last two seasons. That ain't no joke. Yeah, still has a 34.6 college dominator rating, 34.1 college target share. That's 97th percentile. And he still broke out at 19, 87th percentile. So even though he might have been as slender as uh, or more slender than probably people would have liked at the combine, absolutely still should be in your radar. And we're still looking at him being a round two pick in the NFL, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I think still so. I think I, mean, I think it went from like it went from like borderline round one where like he's sitting there probably at the like thirty two to thirty six range, I would think, as far as like being that you know, we've looked at the last decade where it's like, ooh, who's this who's the first receiver taken in round two? Mm -hmm. T. Higgins or Elijah Moore. Right. Or who was the one a couple years ago? Debo Samuel. AJ Brown the was up there. Yep. Yeah. The first receiver taken on day two. Downs was in that conversation. Right. Now I think he falls a little bit further. I mean, he's probably going to be in the 40s and 50s, as I okay. expect. It's like where George Pickens was taken, maybe. Something like that last year. Yeah. So yeah. if that's still the case, you're still going to want him in rookie drafts. Now, post-combine, who is your deep, deep, super deep sleeper for fantasy football? I'll give you two. One will be quick. The second one will dive into a little bit. Well, I'll give you three. Oh, two, little two, game plan bump, baby. Two, two quick ones and then a deep one. Da -da -da. Two quick ones and then a deep one. Two quick ones and then a deep one. All right, the quick one's wow. going to be Daenerys, Daenerys Prince from Tulsa. He's almost 23 years old, but he ran a 4-4-1 at 216 pounds. Most athletic running back in this class. Best comparable to Zamir White. We Daenerys all Prince White last year. Had a great Shrine Bowl. Byron Lambert from Roster Watch was out there. He reported back that Daenerys was the best running back there. That included Tavion Thomas. That included Mohamed Ibrahim. And a couple of other donkeys, not 
that that matters. But Denaire <laughs> Prince was the running back to watch out there. Quarterback, if you're in a deep league where you can have a taxi squad for a year or two or even three, put your boy Tyson Bajant on Let's the go! freaking taxi squad. Yeah! Put him on there. Forget he's there. Lock it in and just hold on for dear life because I promise you in two years you're going to be much appreciative for having the bad boy Bajant on your roster. The agent, now, baby. The one we can talk about a little bit further is Charlie Jones. Charlie Jones is going to do the inverse of what Devon A. Chain did. Everyone's going to be like in fantasy football and dynasty football. I'm not touching Charlie Jones. Charlie Jones is 24 and a half years old. He's going to be 25 when the season kicks off. I don't want Charlie Jones. Blah, 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 he blah. He looks blah, like blah. he's a cast member from One Tree Hill. You know, you know who's best comparable is on playerprofiler.com? Uh, why don't you tell the people listening who the hell it is? Devonta Smith. Oh, the Slim Reaper, Charlie Football, and the Slim Reaper, huh? Number one in routes at the at the combine, thirty one and a half points, two points higher than everybody else on the board. Now, do I think he's Devonta Smith? No, but do I think that is actually in his range of outcomes because he's such a great route runner? Because he ran a four four three, and because he was pissed off when the unofficial number came in on the Both screen times. and said. And I said four three eight, mm-hmm. and they put the cam to him, and he goes, "Motherfucking shit!" And you could see him happy, getting yep. pissed as fuck that he ran a four three eight. So dude knows he's fast. Dude's got the burst. Twenty nine point four percent college target share. Dominated Purdue last year with thirteen hundred yards. College dominator ninetieth percent. Mm-hmm. He's twenty five. He's twenty four and a half, twenty five. You know what? So was you know Cooper Cup was old as shit too. The only problem is he's a little undersized. He's 175. But the inverse, to answer your question, who's the super deep sleeper? It's Charlie Jones. He's going to get drafted probably the fourth or fifth round. And I think it's going to be a guy that you have to have in these certain formats, especially PPR, because he's going to get opportunities because he's a motherfucker in the routes. Given his speed, though, could he uh, get some special teams look? You know, something that kind of can build his confidence within the, an organization? Sure. I mean, you look two years ago at Iowa, 918 uh, total special teams yards. Right. So 100%. That's that's, I mean, he, he's a guy that you're going to be able to put put in there. Think about that speed and and obviously how good he was in route running, his shiftiness and ability to just move around. How do you not put him on gunner? How do you not make him earn that spot? And that's exactly how Adam Thielen earned his spot in Minnesota was playing special teams. Right. Sure, he's a fourth, fifth round pick, but I promise you he's going to be on a roster day one. Mm-hmm. I promise you that. And that just, I mean, we always talk about it. It's that that goes under the radar because it doesn't usually get you fantasy points. But if it can keep you on a roster, get you, get the coaches excited about a player, all of a sudden an injury happens or he just keeps dominating practice and gets those get reps in a game. And all of a sudden he's fantasy relevant. So keep your eye out for Charlie football, Mr. Charlie Jones. And hey, where did, where did, uh, where did Valus Jones get drafted last year? What was it second or third round, right? Third round. Yeah. Right. This Vallis is exactly is the Vellis Jones. Vellis Jones ran quick. Vellis Jones is a little brisker. Mm-hmm. Vellis Jones ain't the route runner Charlie Football is. Okay. And route running, obviously, massive, massive advantage for, for rookies, vets. Doesn't really matter. <clears throat> so we talked about the sleeper. Now it's time for the fun question, Mr. Cody, Mr. Combine Cody. Do you have any bold takes after seeing these rookies in person in Indianapolis? Do you want a draft bold take or do you want a season bold take? Give me a draft one because we'll have you on again before the season. So give me your draft bold take. All right. My NFL draft bold take. I could go to like the defense, but I don't think that'd be, I don't think the people in the chat want to hear me talk about defense. And we talking fantasy football here, baby. All right. My, my NFL draft bold take at the wide receiver position is that both Rashi Rice and Cedric Tillman are second-round picks in the NFL draft. And it's going to throw a complete nuke into everyone's plans as far as fantasy football goes because they're going to go ahead of a lot of guys that we have ranked ahead of them in fantasy football rookie rankings. Oh, I love it. So make sure you use that now. If you're listening, go out and make sure in your startups or if you've already had a rookie draft, get Bryce and get Tillman before it's too late. We are going to hit you off with a one round rookie mock. But before we dive into that, Cody, let me tell you and every one of our listeners about the Dynasty Dominator app. It has the lifetime value lookup tool, trade analyzer and player comparison tool. But 
you can have it in your pocket. You can have it on the go. If you're in Charlotte, North Carolina, putzing around, doing a new brand new show, you can be tuned in for that. Hey, you hey. can just pull out your phone and check it when you have the Dynasty Dominator app. It is the only trade analyzer that is a true mobile app. You can get it both for Apple or for all you weirdos that have Android. You can get it too. And now we have the projected values for the 2023 rookies as well as the 2023 rookie class. I'll have the link in the description. Make sure you are messing with the Dynasty Dominator app. Cody's putting up the screen right now. So if you're watching, Oh, baby, how clean does that thing look? Best app if you're trying to win in Dynasty. Dominate your Dynasty leagues now by downloading the Dynasty Dominator app. Cody, are you ready? Hey, which one of these guys is not the same? I don't know. I can't see. My eyes aren't that good. Tell the people who's, who's not the same. Rashi Rice, top five breakout finder. Oh, shit. Part of the bowl take. So he just had to pepper in an extra bit of his bowl take, and that's why I got to respect you. That's a great move. Absolutely fantastic move. So, Mr. Cody Combine, Cody, shall we get a one-round rookie mock, one QB, 12-team leagues on and popping? You heard. Let's do it. You know, I, I miss you this week. I, I love doing mo- the rookie mocks with you. You know, you're my mock draft bestie. So I am more than excited to get it going today. We will use your 4.0. Go ahead and check that out now at playerprofile.com. Cody Carpentier's 4.0 mock. It is out now, so we will use those landing spots. I'm assuming you're familiar with it, Mr. Carpentier. So I'll also give you the 101 since you are so gracious to guess the game plan here today. Who are you taking at the 101, and are you going to throw out any other name than the one we're all waiting to hear? Uh, if we're using my mock. I think we are. We're, we're con- using your mock. Uh, I think there might be a conversation. Just kidding. Give me Bijan Robinson to the <laughs> Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> Numero Unsk for Bijan Robinson. From the Dallas Cowboys, I think that he goes to the Cowboys. Zeke is out. You haven't said it yet, but he's out. Trust the Mm -hmm. process. He's gone. Tony Pollard on a franchise tag. A year from now, he'll be 26.7. And at that point, Bijan's going to be softly, softly graced graced into this offense. One year from now, Bijan's going to be the motherfucking bell cow of all bell cows in the NFL right now. Give me B-Rob. You have to love that. I know Tony Pollard's still going to be around, but when you have fat boy Mark McCarthy, M- Mike McCarthy. Mark say, McCarthy. When you have him out there saying that all he wants to do is run the damn ball, if he were to get a guy like Bijan Robinson, if he's going to be their bell cow, we're going to see some freaking early 2010s type running back usage from him. Absolute smash pick at the 101. Me here using your mock... Man, you're going to make me get a little bit crazy, I think, right off the rip. And you know what? I don't care because tis the mother effing season. I am surpassing Jackson Smith McJigba because I hate the landing spot. Give me Zay Flowers going to be the wide receiver one of the future for Mr. Justin Herbert. Absolutely love this here. Don't give a fuck. This is my type of pick. I love Jackson. And if Jackson goes to the Chargers, oh, it's on and popping. But – if you're telling me Zay Flowers gets higher draft capital at 21, oh, baby, give me him at the 102. I don't care who knows it. Dog. Don't care who knows it. Dude, I love this so much. This is going to be a fun mock. I can already tell where this is going. Shout out to everybody in the chat. Please roast Maddie because he's about to take another L in a mock draft, even though I love <laughs> Zay Flowers. I but I love this. I'll, I love it. I'll take it. We I'll talked about it. He came in all bodied up, coming in heavy, and oh, baby. I'm talking Justin Herbert. The You want the guy linked to Justin Herbert. That's so exciting. You want the guy with Justin Herbert. Oh, my God, bro. You're pissing me off. Because <laughs> you wanted him. I thought he was going to get him there like in, at the fucking 105. But no. I guess, you know, you're, you're a little too smart for everybody. Um, okay. All right. Well, I'm not taking Gibbs here because he's in the Bears. So I'm going to go. I have to just stick with wide receiver for this whole situation. Do I go in Jigby to Baltimore, given that I don't know who the quarterback is? Psych. I'm going Quentin Johnston, the Detroit Lions, because Quentin Johnston paired up with J-Mo and Amon Ross St. Brown with Jared Goff at quarterback is more than beautiful, and I would take him over Zay Flowers because Quentin Johnston 
in the DJ Chark role is what you expected out of DJ Chark last year. So if you're not drafting Quentin Johnston, if he lands on Detroit, you're going to be in such a good spot if you got Quentin Johnston. Oh, I can't even. You just know I, I have me a little bit of a, an issue with Quentin. I've had, I don't know. I think I've gotten him one time in all of these mocks, and I don't even think it was with you. I think it was when I did it with Theo. So I, I just, for whatever reason, I'm allergic to him, and I'm going to keep the allergies away from me. Now I, will, now I will go ahead and pepper another wide receiver here. Okay, I don't love the landing spot, but I do love the player. I love the talent profile. And at the end of the day, a lot can happen from now till opening day. Rashad Bateman's out there tweeting against the GM. All of a sudden, if he loses faith in him or all of a sudden the organization's like, meh, get the fuck out. Jackson Smith going in round one to the Baltimore Ravens. Don't care who their quarterback is, but I do believe it will be Lamar. So give me Jackson at the 104. Starting slot receiver in Pittsburgh right now is Steven Sims. Not in a month. Put Jordan Addison on the board, baby. You know I hate that landing spot too, but the way you say it just there, I was like, okay, but I just don't believe in Pickett. Can I, can I ask you this? Okay, as a player evaluator, as the emperor of evaluations, can I buy into Addison? Can I buy into the young thug George Pickens if I do not believe in Kenny Pickett? I think you can because of the same reason we can believe in Jared Goff. I hate Jared Goff. I hate Kenny Pickett. But these guys are just competent enough where they can get the ball out. So a, lot, a lot of people hate Derek Carr, but guess what? Derek Carr can get the ball from A to B better than a lot of people can. All right? That's so fair. it works. And when you look at New Orleans and you look at a team that, you know, I have Booty going to New Orleans, you put Booty, Michael Thomas, and Chris Olave in an offense, Derek Carr is going to be hella competent enough to get the ball to these guys. Mm-hmm. And Juwan Johnson. Need I forget. Now you look at Detroit. You give him Quinton. You give him Jamal. You give him Amonra. You give him running backs. Hella competent. You give Kenny Pickett enough dudes around him. Jordan Addison, Pickens, Deontay, a running back, and Najee, big dog Fryermuth. Hella competent. I think that the connection between Pickett and Addison has been there. It was there. And if you connect these guys back together, I think you're going to be happy. And I think Deontay's going to be out of a job in about a year. But here, here's the thing, though. Can you? Can you keep multiple pass catchers relevant in fantasy if you have a tough time holding a double whopper? Jesus, is that Lord. possible? Yes, yes. If you if you if you order a, you know a triple double at In and Out and you can't <laughs> hold it, is it tough to grip a football? <laughs> if you have to smush down your your backyard burgers because your know, backyard burgers are always them fat patties. If you have to mush it down because you can't quite hold with, with those hands, can you throw it to a whole bunch of receivers? That's my biggest problem. But hey, Jordan Addison here makes a whole lot of sense. I can't really knock you. Okay, we've had enough fun with these wide receivers, but I am going back to the running back position. Give me Jameer Gibbs. He was ultra fast, and he looked great in the combine. And you have him going to the Chicago Bears. If you haven't checked, David Montgomery is looking like he is out the door. I do love me some Khalil Herbert. Jameer Gibbs going into that offense that we now are looking at ooh, a team with a whole lot more firepower. So give me Mr. Gibbs here at the 106. I feel like it's a steal, baby. This is when it gets interesting, brother. Uh, I like Gibbs going to Chicago, but because the Chicago's looking at running backs, they were just at Texas yesterday uh, or two days ago with the Bijan Roshan mm-hmm. workout. So I think they're going to be in on all these running backs as are the Chiefs, the Chiefs also. I know there was news that came out that the Bears uh, took the Bijan and Roche on the dinner, but the Chiefs were also, they took them out to dessert. So stay in on that. Ooh. We're looking at the rest of these guys, though, on the board. Obviously, Sharps is there next. Roshan's there next. Roshan's going to naturally come down a little beat, as uh, our friend Jack Cavanaugh would say in his Canadian accent. But if they look at the rest <laughs> oh, of these guys, A-Chain we talked about a little bit. But on my board right now, the next guy that was drafted was Jalen Hyatt to Houston and Josh Downs to Indianapolis. Now, if this entire draft molds out the way that I wrote and mocked it to, Mm -hmm. which is uh, Bryce Young to Houston, Jalen Hyatt to Houston, and Devon A. Chain to Houston, I think you have to consider Hyatt as a respectable source to go Mm -hmm. to Houston at number seven. But I I can't pull that trigger because, like I said, in fantasy, I'm just not there. So then that begs the question, do I go to tight end? Michael Mayer was the first tight end off the board, Mm -hmm. and Green Bay needs somebody to come in there and replace Bob Tunyon. Do I go with Bob Tunyon? No. 
Don't okay. go with Zach Charbonnet because Zach Charbonnet is going to play with Saquon Barkley. No. Oh. You see where I'm going? Like, this is a very oh. tough spot to be in. It is. When you get to this stage right here, this is where I want to trade out because there's a lot of guys that I like, a lot of situations I love. But uh, quite frankly, if you're sitting at the set, we talked about this in like two mocks ago. If you're sitting at seven, eight, nine. Mm-hmm. I want to get out and I want to go back to 13, 14, 15 so I can get any of these guys that I want later on. So, quite right. honestly, who I'm going to take right here is Kendra Miller. I'm going to take Kendra Miller who I had going 119 overall round four to the Minnesota Vikings. I love that landing spot. That's why it's because of the landing spot Madison's gone. Kendra Miller is 20 and a half years old. He's not going to test through his entire process. So you need to stay in your process and keep him up into that top 12. And right now, based on these current landing spots, based on these current landing spots, I would take Kendra ahead of all these guys. And we've heard the rumors. They've gotten trade offers for Delvin cook. I don't think he's going to be there. Come the season, it's clear yeah. that the, the Vikings are looking to not rebuild but retool and kind of get more flexible with their cap. They just cut Adam Thielen. They're taking yep. offers on Dalvin Cook. They are going to have to pay Jamar Chase, uh, uh, Justin Jefferson, I don't know, a gajillion and one dollars. So I definitely think that that's a great pick and a fantastic landing spot. Now, I'm going to get uh, – I, I got my favorite landing spot. I'm going to save it, though, because I do not think – he is going to be uh, selected here before the end of this first round. So I am going to pivot, and I'm going to go with Tajay Spears going to the Miami Dolphins. Tajay elected not to run, which I don't know. Why do you think he didn't run? Because I thought he would look great compared to a lot of these running backs running the 40. He had that burst, though. I mean, all he, he did burst, he looked great through drills. Yeah. He, he looked fantastic in the drills. I'm surprised he didn't want to show off his straight line speed because he is projected to run pretty fast in his pro day, right? Yeah. we. I mean, we had to use, in order to put him in the breakout finder, we had to use a, a placeholder for a 40-yard dash. And uh, our placeholder was four four six, and we mm-hmm. always try to stay on the on the safe side of those projections, right? So like JSN is only in there because we had to put a, a holding forty in there. Spears should run the low four fours. Is right. he going to run? I don't. I hope so because he's got to when he does his, his pro day. I would imagine. I hope so. Okay, so who do you got here at the one hundred and nine? Again, tough conversation to be had, yes. but I think I mentioned him just a minute ago as one of the guys we have to stay in on. Based on right now, let's see, where did, what pick did he go exactly? 40. Pick 40 overall, Kayshawn Booty to the New Orleans Saints. Again, more than likely he's going to be a second-round pick in a lot of rookie drafts. But given this current mock, if he lands the Saints at pick 40, and he's with Michael Thomas and Chris Olave and Derek Carr, Kayshawn Booty needs to have first-round considerations in fantasy football, mm-hmm. 109. So I, I don't know if I would – have the balls to do this in one QB, but in this mock, clearly I'm ready to hang, let it all hang out. And yeah. this is the only quarterback I, I am taking potentially in round one or two. Yeah, I know you see it. In in a one QB league, this is the only QB I think who has the ceiling to be a smasher. So at the 110, give me Anthony Richardson. You have him going fifth to the Panthers. And so I am going to translate that to the 101. I think that's a fair translation. In your mock, you had the Panthers trading up for Richardson, they just traded up to the 101. I know there's rumors that uh, it's going to be young, it's going to be Stroud, but we're using your mock. So give me a rich on the Panthers because if they ain't no receivers, they got a pretty good offensive line. Uh, Matt talked about it uh, last night in our spaces that the Carolina Panthers, you know, they get, they get a lot of good blocking lanes for for runners, and it, we're looking at a quarterback with no receivers we're looking kind of like justin fields in 2023 or 2022 a rich is the 2023 version give me all that rushing upside give me that fantasy production and i want a guy in one qb who has the chance to be an absolute monster so give me a rich here at the 110 i will say you're right and you're wrong in both facets i had carolina trading up for richardson but I did have Stroud at number 101, and I think that that is who they ended up trading up for with C.J. Stroud. Because after the combine, that's, that's why fair. I put him there, was that I thought he was the the locked-in guy that everyone would be uh, looking at. Mm-hmm. So you're right and you're wrong. The aspect that you're right in is that Stroud or Richardson is going to be a top-10 pick, and even if he's a top-10 pick, no matter what, like you said, yeah, one, two, three, four, no I've matter what. I've been saying it. I've been saying it, and it, I think it's happening. Yeah. It's just, even if it's one, two, three, four, if it's one, two, four, five, and it's an Oreo on top of Will Anderson, I still think it's it's the same conversion rate where you can still say Anthony Richardson 
he can be a first round pick and he can be drafted ahead of CJ Stroud because of that Konami aspect and being a top five pick matters. Um, so I, I 100% can respect that. Now is where you get interesting because Charbonnet, obviously we talked about being next to Saquon Barkley. And then, of course, I put Roshan to the Arizona Cardinals. Now, Devon A. Chain still there to Houston. Tank Bigsby to Atlanta. I don't love – like, look at all those situations are kind of uh, uh, kind of shitty. Um, so I think out of the one out of those running backs that I would probably take at this certain – this exact point would be – uh, I'm, I'm going to go Roshan because of Arizona yep. because it's it's James Conner and I think that it's a James Conner is a fantastic player for Roshan to learn from and I think that you know we, what have we known about James Conner? Yeah, he had one he had one great season where he stayed healthy the whole year, banged up for a couple, and then another great season for Arizona and then banged up for a little bit. So I mm-hmm. think that Roshan goes into Arizona and he's already been in an offense with Keontae Ingram. He's going to go in there. And he's going to say, hey, Keontae, why don't you go transfer again? And then he's going to be the number two from day one next to James <laughs> Conner. And as soon as anything happens to James Conner, Roshan could take on that same workload as James mm-hmm. Conner. Give me Roshan Johnston. The only reason I would take him ahead of Charbonnet, given the draft capital difference, is because Saquon's in, the front, of, in front of Charbonnet, and that's going to blockade him for an entire season, where if you go back to the beginning of the show, when I talked about how I attack Dynasty Leagues, it's mm-hmm. about the now, it's about the when, it's about the who, and that's Kendra Miller. Dalvin Cook's gone. Kendra steps right in. Kayshawn Booty, he's got the quarterback. He's got the receivers running. Now, Roshan Johnson, James Conner in the way. Could get hurt week two. Roshan Johnson steps in. Absolutely. He's got the skill set. He's got the size. I like that. That's a great pick. If you've been following Cody and I's mocks, you already know that I'm willing to piss away one of my last picks that we do on the show for my guy here. And I'm going to do it again because it's my damn show. Give me Deuce motherfucking Vaughn going to the Kansas City Chiefs here at pick 134. I love Deuce Vaughn. You know it. And this is the type of landing spot that I do absolutely clamor over. Love it. Love it. Love it. But, obviously, I won't be taking him in my 112. But since we're only doing 12 picks here, Cody, you know I'm talking about Deuce, eh, baby? Bro, I, I want – did you listen to the future cast by chance? It's okay to say no. Did you listen to the future cast? I have not yet. Cast? No, I have not. You know I was it, on the road last week, so I have, I'm way backed up in my pods. So, I just dropped uh, last night. I did the show yesterday live. Mm-hmm. Deuce Vaughn, I talked about him in this mock draft. And, and the way I, I finished the show up, because I went through this entire four-round mock on the future cast this week, and I got to pick 134 to finish it out. And I go, this is how you repay Chiefs things, Chiefs Nation, Chiefs Kingdom, and that is by doing or, or fixing your wrongs, fixing your wrongs with a right. You should always take running backs at the end of round four, early round five in the NFL draft. Never pick 30 fucking two after a Super Bowl championship. They right their wrong by releasing Clyde Edwards Hilaire and then taking the guy that is similar to Clyde Edwards Hilaire, but better, more shifty, more agile, better pass catcher, better dynamic athlete, deuce motherfucking Vaughn to replace Clyde Edwards Hell out of here. The Kansas City Chiefs do the right thing. <laughs> deuce. I love it. He's he's bad running back on player profile, but now I think we need to change it back to Clyde Edwards Hell out of here because that is fan <laughs> freaking tastic. All right, so let's round up the first round rookie mock that we did here. Bijan, 101. Zay Flowers, 102. Quentin Johnson, Jackson Smith, Najigba. Jordan Addison hit the three, four, and five. Jameer Gibbs, Kendra Miller, Tajay Spears. A nice little running back run there, 1 6 to 1 8. Kayshawn Booty, A Rich, Roshan Johnson, and my novelty pick that I can never leave without Deuce motherfucking Vaughn. Before we say goodbye, which guy left on the board? Because there's obviously a lot of fantasy relevant players. There are a lot of fantasy relevant guys that will be going in the one first round, the second round above Deuce Vaughn. But who do you have here that's left that you just want to talk about that you love on your mock draft? We already talked about Josh Downs. Josh Downs landed in Indianapolis uh, with Will Levis, I think is a good spot. But again, this offense is just too murky for me with Pittman, Pierce on the outside. Who is the quarterback? Is it Will Levis? Um, I think that's a good spot, good fit for Josh Downs, but also you have the running game. You also have just a, a mess, I guess, as far as the franchise is concerned. So Josh Downs is one that's there. Charbonnet is also there. And then, of course, Rashi if he lands in Atlanta, but there's no quarterback. So that's why those guys don't jump into We already talked about Charbonnet. So that's why those three guys, I think, should be in consideration for round one, aren't in round one. Okay. And the uh, so I'll, uh, 
if you've been following these mocks, you know I also love me some Jalen Hyatt, but that landing spot now does not look as appealing. Brandon Cooks is changing his tune. He wants to stick around. Obviously, DeMarco Mur- uh, De- DeMeco Ryans is coming in and changing the culture on the fast track. They just signed Bobby Trees. I don't. They still have John Mechie coming back. The Nico Collins. I don't love Jalen Hyatt there as much with a rookie quarterback. That's why I did not take him here, even though I've been so uh, uh, you know pretty excited about him. But the guy I'm going to talk about, you had him going to the Cincinnati Bengals right around where Deuce Vaughn went to the Kansas City Chiefs. That's Evan Hull. I think that's a great landing spot for him. He kind of can do it all. He's shown that he can catch the ball. He can. He's a pretty good running back, and he's got the size at 5'10", 209. That's, that, that's above that thresh mark that we look for. And he was above the 75th percentile in 40-yard dash, speed score, and burst score. Best player, player comparable is Eno Benjamin. I think if Eno Benjamin was a guy that was, uh, you know, in line for potentially being uh, the number one running back on a team like the Cincinnati Bengals. We would love that. So if Evan Hull is there. Oh, that's somebody I'm absolutely taking there in the second round. So that's going to wrap up uh, the round one rookie mock. Cody, I cannot wait to get back in the lab and knock out some more rookie mocks with you. My bestie when it comes to the mocks. I usually like to give our listeners some homework, a little homework assignment so that they can continue to get better as they add these tools to their belt for fantasy. And my homework assignment is check out Cody's rookie mo- oh, NFL mock 4.0. Also, check out the mocks we've been doing in the rookie draft and do some rookie mocks on your own. The best way to get familiar, to feel comfortable in your rookie mocks for your home leagues is to practice. Practice makes perfect. So check out what somebody with Cody's expertise has to say about the NFL landscape. Check out what a bonehead and Cody can do with these rookie mocks. Meathead and Mo- the maestro of mocks and the meathead. That might have to be another show title. It's pretty fantastic. But make sure you have a basis for yourself. That's the best way to be familiar, be comfortable in your rookie mocks. And my final thought is don't let the hype take you away. Make sure that you have guys like Cody and you're following them because they're going to keep you centralized. They're going to keep you grounded when the mo- when the hype train <laughs> spins you to Mars. So make sure you stay grounded. Make sure you don't buy into the hype too, too much throughout this process. Cody, please tell everyone listening where they can find you on socials, where they can find all your fantastic content. You find me at Carpenter NFL on the Twitters and the Instagram you can find all my shits on Player Profiler. The new NFL draft section, the top left of Player Profiler, is where you can find the draft order. You can find my mock draft 4.0. You can find the mock draft index, all things of that nature. Also, the future cast going on Fridays. Mm-hmm. Next week, it'll have a few more episodes and a few more episodes because I'll be boots on the ground at the Clemson and Georgia and South Carolina Pro Days, followed by a couple more the next week, followed by I see in the chat asking about Israel Abanacanda. We haven't seen a 40 yet. He's a guy that you definitely need to be paying attention to. I'm going to be at the Abanacanda Pro Day up at Pittsburgh in just three weeks. Going to be exciting to see what he runs at 40. And so stay tapped in, stay tuned in at Player Profiler at Roto Underworld on Twitter, at Carpentier NFL on Twitter. That's where everything's at, bad boy. And, uh, again, I appreciate you, Matty for having me on here. And I can't, cannot wait for this show that might be dropping at some point in the near future. I don't know, um, but what I do know is you need to subscribe to this channel right here, The Game Plan, and to Roto Underworld Player Profiler on YouTube and on podcast because uh, there's something coming. The show isn't even out yet, but the critics are saying it's the best new podcast in fantasy football. So stay tuned for that. That's going to be a wrap on episode 26 of The Game Plan. Make sure you like this video. And like Cody says, subscribe, subscribe, subscribe to the Player Profiler YouTube channel. And follow me on Twitter as well. I'm at Matty Kiwum. Follow both of the Player Profiler TikToks at Player Profile and Profile underscore NFL for fantastic takes. My man Aaron is doing editing up the wazoo. He's killing it over there. And I got some videos coming out as well. And if you love fantasy football, which you obviously do, make sure you are joined and tapped into the Player Profiler Discord because me, Cody, and other members of the Roto Underworld team are talking fantasy 24-7. Keep game planning, my friends, and I will see you next week. Peace.